and just while Amy's <clears throat> just right while Amy's responding um, first of all just again a reminder to everybody like if, if anyone wants to be a panelist just let me know and I'll make sure to add you no pressure if you prefer to hang out in the chat that's totally fine um, but we just found that the more panelists we have there's the, the conversation kind of can get pretty vibrant um, I've always kind of um, <laughs> <laughs> do you want to do you want to restate your question if you yes so my question to amy was how did she become a community manager how did she uh, you know grow into her own uh, she's a fabulous community manager for the open infrastructure summit the OpenStack summit and she says that she had to kick a chicken out of the house and that's why she couldn't respond what a great excuse <laughs> <laughs> That's a thing. <laughs> yes, Gordon, please um, join us. Yep, I'm here. Yay. Gordon, is that a background or is that real? Uh, yeah, that's a background. <laughs> I was going to say, you've got a lot of books. I have a lot of books in my office, but not that many. <laughs> <laughs> wow. I think just says, when I think of community managers, I think of leaders who set the community culture and help direct the project. Absolutely. Um, some of the best community managers I've seen, and I'm going to ask you, Gordon, also for your example, because you've written a fantastic book about how open source gets done. To me, um, there are two aspects to open source, right? One is the license, but the second is how the community comes together to get work done. And some of the best community managers are people who make sure that users and contributors and maintainers all have a role to play and work well together. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that strike, you know, kind of strikes me with the good community managers I know is, I mean, it, it varies because it's, you know, communities are very different, but I mean, they are people persons, um, you know, they're, they're really good at reaching out, really good with making people feel, you know, they belong, uh, that they're, that people are participating, even if it's not necessarily natural for them to, uh, to you know, even if they, you know, they feel like they should be hanging back. So I, I think that's the first thing I think of as a community manager. And, and quite frankly, I think it's one reason that I, I think I would have trouble with the role personally because I don't necessarily do that kind of thing naturally. Can it be taught? Do you think uh, community management can be taught or do they have to innately be people oriented and people managers? Uh, I think many things can be taught, uh, but it will pro probably comes more naturally to some people than with others. I mean, I think if somebody like myself, for example, go, yeah, next thing I will do is be a community manager. I would have to go in knowing I'm really going to have to work it overcoming my kind of natural tendencies to kind of go off in a room and do my own thing. I get the impression that it can be taught, but <clears throat> my kind of feeling is that um, I think people can learn the principles and the approaches, um, but I think that the motivation of what, you know, when you wake up in the morning and you're just really excited about doing your thing, um, I think the kind of people who are just motivated by by working with people and building human systems um, and enjoying that, that meaty challenge of the mixture of workflow and people and emotion. I don't think there's, everybody's attracted to that. So therefore, I think anyone can learn it, but staying excited about it strikes me that people just have different intrinsic motivations yeah yeah i mean it, it's um i mean it's different obviously but it's like with say, you know, like doing sales for example if uh you know yeah i mean most engineers can probably be taught to be at least you know decent sales people but a lot of them are not going to really want that role um i mean uh, sorry go ahead go ahead please <laughs> Oh, thanks, Cynthia. Yeah, I mean, I actually like the term facilitator. 
um, instead of because I get comfortable when somebody calls me like a leader uh, in the community. That's I mean it's it's very nice. I'm flattered, but I think I my I view my, my role more of as a facilitator and enable people to do their work like whatever they're best at. And uh, this is sort of more. I mean, this is one of your original questions, Nadia. Like, what are some of the effective trainings that people can do? Um, I got started by just facilitating meetings. Um, I mean, I didn't have the technical expertise in that networking arena that I was involved in, but you know, I like it, it, it doesn't have to be a huge steering committee meeting. It could be a simple work group, but just being familiar with what people are concerned about, what resources they need. And then, you know, my job I thought was to advocate for those people, whether it's going to the management or going to the board even, right? So uh, it's kind of, you know, uh, drinking water through the fire hose, but being active and in involving working group meetings or various meetings for the on behalf of the community, I think could be a good way to sort of get up to speed on things. That's, that's such a great, great um, uh, point that you make, Raymond, because um, most of us got started in a small way. And then, you know, we started building up all of the skill sets needed, right, to be a community manager. The other thing I often hear from community managers is, each project is different, what it needs is different, and the skill sets you bring to the table are different. So there is no one cookie cutter community manager role, but the things you mentioned, advocating for developers and people, you know, facilitating people to feel included and to contribute to the project and building relationships with the project such, such that they want to stay in the project are all such key elements, right? Amy's I think a lot, Go I was going to say, I think a lot about uh, like it's the day to day activity of building consensus so that um, so you have this like large goal at the top of your project and then someone's like, I'm kind of struggling with this little piece on the bottom and and they maybe don't understand how their piece fits in or they have been asked to do it in a way that kind of runs counter to the end goal um, just because someone didn't understand the nuts and bolts of their work. And so so it's like the a good community manager sort of builds consensus and is like, oh, hey, we should ask them to do this top to bottom instead of bottom to top because it'll produce a better result for the overall project and they'll be more motivated and help them understand the, the piece that this role plays in the larger whole. Very, very good point. Um, are, what resources have you all kind of used to become a community manager? Uh, for example, for me, it was reading books. It was on the job training. Um, just like, uh, you know, you said, Raymond, uh, it was running meetings and then taking on something else and then taking on something else. But what other resources are there for community managers to become you know, better community managers. I'd like to add something to the to that conversation, just kind of a, the natural intrinsic piece. I think you really need to have the energy and the motivation. It, it, it is exhausting. When you work with large groups, you're dealing with lots and lots and lots of different people, lots of different personalities, and you have to really kind of put up that like kind of a border because you can get really, really exhausted relatively pretty quickly, especially if you lead large, large forums. So I definitely think it's really important to just like have the energy naturally to do it. I think is um, that's just one of those things that's just kind of, you know, you can build that over time. So that's just my little point I wanted to jump in and add. You know, Brittany, just kind of underlining what you just said. Um, I, I do think that I, I get the impression that when people really find their calling and what they're really excited about, it's because they're just infinitely curious about what it is. And it doesn't necessarily mean that they have to be great at it, uh, but they're just really interested in learning the details and how it all fits together and how it glues together. Um, and I think some industries are well supported with that. So for example, if you want to be a, a founder of a company or you want to be an entrepreneur, there's hundreds and hundreds of business books out there to help you through that journey. And um, there's less of that for community managers. And uh, and I think Nithya mentioned this earlier on that the scope, the role and the scope of community managers varies so significantly with different industries. I mean, just for me, when I'm working with my clients, you know, the way in which people build open source communities is totally different to the way in which people build gaming communities, for example. And I think that's one of the reasons why 
and I don't mean this as in a braggadocious way, I think events like CLS are important. So, and, you know, and CMX and, you know, DevRelCon and all these events are so important because I think it's an opportunity for people to go and be curious with their friends. So, so, so uh, I, go ahead, please. Yeah, please go ahead. So I was just uh, wanted to add certain points to it that uh, I clearly, uh, completely agree with with him that uh, it is moreover that somebody should have the inspiration and motivation to do any role. That is one of the point which is really very important. Simultaneously, any skills or uh, the uh, capabilities can be built with the time because roles and uh, responsibilities that evolve with time. So uh, you gradually you always have to keep updating your skills and capabilities with the time. So that can be built on the job. Uh, as the time evolves. However, uh, there is that basic nature, uh, which which is motivation, which is really needed whenever you get into any new role. Uh, Anjali, you summarized it really, really well. I think what I heard from a lot of people is there needs to be that energy and motivation and emotional you know, desire to do uh, a community leadership role because it does take a lot of um, you know, motivation to do it. And then we talked about a couple of resources to uh, grow your skill sets. One was you know, just on the job, like Ray was saying, taking on small things, uh, small groups of facilitation and you know, keep building those skills. The second, I have to um, say plus one to what Jono said. I think the Community Leadership Summit has been a fantastic opportunity to share best practices across teams and across people and say, hey, how are you handling this? How are you handling this? We do the same with the open source program offices as well. And that's been a great way for me to have learned, uh, you know, what somebody else is doing and how to grow, you know, on my own skill sets from a community management perspective. Um, do you think there's a, there's a role for mentorship in uh, community leadership, you think we should do a more formal mentorship program where we match up people who are rising stars in the community world and senior uh, community leaders? Yes, I think uh, that is uh, I would say that would be really good. And I would, I would, uh, I don't know that how much important it is, but uh, I was, since I'm from India, so uh, I have not been part of open source since long. So I just got uh, introduced with certain people who helped me out in the open source community. So a lot of people, they don't know about the open source community that how you need to work with it and how you can get involved in the different projects. So it, uh, it is something that uh, you can also improve the reach so that a lot of people where they, they don't have this reach so they can also get involved into it and they can pick up certain good projects just to enhance their skills. So that is one of the good things. Yeah. Thank you. Hi, this is Ray. Uh, my name's Ray Eisenberg. I work with the World Bank and I certainly, I certainly agree about motivation. However, we have over 400 communities of practice at the World Bank worldwide dealing with multiple themes, whether it's women's education, health, poverty, transparency in government, demilitarization, kind of name any social theme, and the World Bank's there to the tune of over $70 billion a year. So we, about eight or nine years ago, kind of before I joined, there were lots of communities of practice being started, uh, but lots were failing, and notwithstanding the motivation and the goodwill, and goodwill driven by incredible motivation around these causes, everybody at the World Bank totally believes in the cause, cause which is to end poverty and to uh, reduce income inequality. But they were failing. So we started several programs. Uh, we do um, a formal training for individuals, uh, several programs a year. We do uh, co in coaching for teams. We do analysis of whole departments to see where community can play a place. And fourthly, we have, we have mentorship from successful community managers mentoring other more junior managers. So I certainly believe that um, it can be taught. You still have, that have to have that motivation. 
but it still be, can be taught. I mean, the way I got into it, I kind of fell into it through training and um, kind of a light bulb went on when the answer to the question at the end of training sessions, what did you get most out of the training was meeting other people. And <laughs> I realized we never did anything before to facilitate that collaboration. We did a little bit during, but after they were trained, it was like, bye, next class, please. You know, and now we have a much more before, during and after approach to, to training. And, and that's how I got into community an online community and you know I read books and at the time there was hardly any literature there there were no Jonah Bacon's at the time I had mm -hmm. Etienne Wenger you know that was my that was my bible facilitating communities of practice and I'm talking about communities of practice not uh, online support communities open development communities that kind of thing so uh, Etienne Wenger and then then it started getting uh, much bigger with Bill Johnson and Richard Millington at Fever B and David Spinks at CR uh, at CMX and and now there's a, now if you go to look for uh, works on community there's a, a, a whole slew of stuff and of course two great books by Jonah Bacon I would have to mention that yeah. so uh, so it definitely you know um, it definitely can be taught but obviously it's going to be much much better on top of motivation. And I will say one caveat at the World Bank, a lot of people are managing community who are not community managers and don't want to be community managers. Uh, but you still have to give them some tools in which to enable them to have some success at least and not do the totally wrong thing. Uh, come back at the end of the day, say, why isn't my community working well? You're not even welcoming people who've joined. You're not even saying thank you to the first contribution. Of course, they're going to go away. So there's lots and lots and lots of tips and techniques and, and um, other practical and technical things you can do to help someone be a successful either community leader, which is slightly different at the World Bank, or a community manager, which is, again, slightly different than what you're used to. I think those two roles are often combined at the bank. They're different. I, I think, thank you so much, Ray. You, you bring up a really good point, which is, uh, community leadership and community management really transcends technical projects to, you know, other problem solving areas, um, such as what the World Bank is trying to do. And that, yes, mentorship and formal mentorship would really help um, and providing tools and techniques that community managers can use is, is important as well. Um, one of the things we try to do um, where Brittany and I work, we have a couple of tools that we use. We use Slack, for example, to get our communities of interest together. We do meetings. Um, we try to incentivize to the previous discussion that Jono had. Um, and, and, you know, we, we need some uh, tools and techniques to make community leaders successful. There's, there's yeah. a whole bunch of comments, please, uh, Raymond. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I, I definitely want to second like a lot of comments that people made because I mean, the most of my learnings came from other community managers, like at, at events like CLS or other open source conferences, you have hallway conversations, follow up on their sessions. And also, I mean, what I've noticed is that a lot of people reach out to me on LinkedIn because they're trying to form a new community and they wanted to find out how we did it at my previous jobs. and. I really try to make time because I mean, a lot of people help me in my career. It's like, it's my duty to help others that come along. So it doesn't have to be any formal, like a mentorship program, just make time available for people that want to get started with new communities or new ventures. And I really want to encourage people to do that because during the process, I also learned something because I mean, they reached out to me to learn what I did, but I find that about their approach and their communities. and. Uh, it's it's really worth worth everybody's time, I think. Nithi, can I jump in? Yes, please. Hi. Hi, Hi friends old and new. Hi, I'm Karsten. And um, um, why, what was I just thinking about? Sorry, my brain just derailed. So the, the I just want to segueing off the communities of practice and what, um, and, and, and to bring up something, actually, I've got a community, a couple people here who are writers in the community I wanted to talk about, but um, 
um, what I was thinking about, sorry, is that we, uh, a, a number of years ago, we, or over the course of the last two couple decades, which is a lot of stuff we've talked about, right? I mean, I'm one of the, someone like, like Nithya and like everyone else who sort of had to scrap this together as I was figuring out how to do community management over the years. And um, what I wanted to bring up was, was to follow up on what Ray was saying about communities of practice is a, uh, and, and also in the sort of vein of uh, the carpenter's roof is leaking and are we gonna get around to fixing our own roof kind of thing. Uh, we, we uh, our, our team at Red Hat a dozen more years ago wrote a, a, wrote a, a book for our internal use that we then open source called the open source way. And the purpose of that was we're always answering these same questions. Can we write down these, the, not just the what and the how, but the why, because the why is a really important part that seems to get lost, the stories we all have. Um, and that's been out there for a little while. And last year, we decided to do the 2.0 version of the, of the guide to update it with the evolution of the way things have been. And I've, and, um, and, and Gordon and Ray are actually, or Raymond uh, are both, uh, have chapters in the, the updated, uh, or the upcoming version that's coming out. And what's really happened here, which was what I was excited about and hoping for so much was that we would turn into a community of practice. That there would be a lot more than just like, let's write a book and then see you next year, maybe we'll write another book kind of thing. And, um, and this has come out of, uh, I, I know for example, directly that um, our open source program office at Red Hat has begun to use the, the open source way as an upstream community. So when we're working on um, a white paper about governance or, um, or even some of, the, some of the content that just came out around uh, Red Hat's open source practices that were announced last week, um, there, you know, all those things cross and form each other, and we consider the open source way to be the upstream for all those materials, but not as, you know, Red Hat's sole upstream, but we really want to grow a community there. And so I, I want to sting right now is we've got a pretty good organizational diversity of people, um, individuals and groups, um, you know, probably nine or 10 different sort of things. We're definitely getting that community angle. So I just wanted to point that out and encourage people. Um, I'll drop a couple more links in chat, uh, but that uh, we're actively working on the preview release of the guide, which should be out by the end of this month, and that'll include um, the introduction in several chapters, um, working on that in GitHub. And uh, we are, uh, meta conversations are happening on the, um, the forum slash mailing list as well. And um, yeah, so that's, I, so I'm, this is also a pitch for writers to anybody who's looking at a little bit of time and wants to go into GitHub and pick up one of the open chapters or sections, we're still looking to close the, the loop on a few things for, for that. But the main thing is going forward into next year, the community is gonna, gonna reboot itself under a new governance, it's gonna figure it out, kick me out as project leader, thank you, and figure out something that's, that's more, and, and just continue to constantly use our own best practices and to just kind of keep repeating back around on that. Yeah. Um, and, and I don't know that it's the only community practice that has to arise out of this. I think that there may be multiple angles to take, but this particular run around open source software development and community management thereof is a, you know, kind of an important subset of things. Thanks. Thank you so much, Karsten. Um, Brittany was just reminding us that if you have any links to share, if you have any resources to share, kindly update it on the Google Docs so that we can make it available to everybody. Um, I heard, Yes, mentorship is important. And then Raymond also brought up informal mentorship, peer-to-peer -peer mentorship. Um, I think it would be fantastic if those of you, I see some amazing community managers here who can update their Twitter or LinkedIn or whatever to say I'm willing and able to mentor uh, or to help somebody. That would then signal to people that you're you know, available to be contacted and uh, to, you know, for someone to ask you a question. Um, and yeah, also, yeah, Karsten, go just ahead. Very, just very briefly on that note, um, I've been experimenting with this a little bit recently. So I did this community access bootcamp a little while back, which was a bunch of training sessions. People joined it and, um, and then we kind of got together in a Slack community. And then also just What's ongoing right now is, is a book club, which is actually an idea from some community members who are reading People Powered. Um, so I think we tend to think of mentoring as being very much one on one. Um, but I also think there's some great I mean, this I can imagine being really great around the work that you're doing, Karsten, with the with, with, with the communities of practice, like getting people together for joint sessions. Um, and Ray touched on this earlier on as well, just um, half the value is not just the training, it's the it's the people as well that you're with. So I, I think this would be amazing to do more of that. I'm certainly happy to volunteer and help. So, yep. I yeah. Mean, um, I was going to add that I think the um, it's good to have books and it's good to have like uh, 
solid resources and repositories of information. But I, I think when I think about the work that we uh, that I did as a community organizer doing local work in Massachusetts before I came to free software, we did a lot of like this, like in-person trainings, but we also like shared new tips and techniques that we learned. And we modeled like some of those things in our training sessions with each other. And then we took them back to our community. So it'd be like something something really simple where uh, there was like one year somebody said like at the end of this meeting, I'm going to ask you what you thought went well and what you didn't think went well. And it was like pluses and deltas. And within a year, like every single meeting I went to had two minutes at the end where people got to say what went well about the meeting and what didn't go well. And I think that feedback part is critical. It's like the piece that you need um, to go with the static resources when you're grafting in techniques and strategies from another community is you need to always be asking your community like, hey, how is this working for you? Maybe we don't need 50 minutes to talk about last year's thing. Maybe we need five hours or maybe we need five minutes. But you can't just always take something in from a, a different type of community, a different size community and be like, this is the best practice. You have to also do a little fitting. That's such a fantastic point. It's a living, breathing science and you've got to constantly be seeing if it needs to be adjusted. And, and to the earlier point we all made, communities are different, needs are different. You need to constantly keep adjusting, you know, what works, what doesn't. Um, any, any other points on, Joshua, you joined us as, as a panelist. I, it looks like you have something that you wanna share. Oh, I don't know. I, I'm always wondering if I should Please. Um, formulate my thought more before saying it, which is what I was doing there. Um, but the, what I was, what's sort of turning around in my head and what, what Deb made me think about is um, I've been at uh, IEEE Standards Association for three years now. And when I first joined, I thought it was going to, and, and it has been, a lot of me teaching them about open source. And what really surprised me is how much I learned to bring into open source from this, you know, really rich standards community with 130 year history. Um, not only, um, you know, just being completely unaware that there has been these communities that are so similar to open source communities and the problems and the uniqueness or what I thought of <laughs> uniqueness to open source communities dating back, you know, um, with, you know, uh, practically references to herding cats back in like 1910. <laughs> it was one of the first things I came across. And like all of these personality types being exactly the same, um, doing consensus-based work um, back then. And it was, you know, and all these geeky things um, like the, the Morse Society putting on a dinner um, in, at the turn of the century where the whole menu was in Morse code and it was a tribute to Thomas Edison. and you know, you're just sort of these geeky little things that I'm like, wow, and, and this is in our archives at, at the IEEE. So that's, you know, what, what I mean, stumbling across these, I mean, literally at work coming across, um, you know, experiences and, and things, but then also more practical things, not just sort of a sense of, wow, that I'm a part of sort of a much bigger thing than I realized when it comes to communities of practice. And with that has a lot of mix of you know, engineers and, and, and um, everything else it takes to put something into the world, <laughs> not just engineering, um, uh, coming together to, to do things practical. But, um, you know, just basic things like uh, Robert's Rules of Order. I kind of knew what it was. I could kind of take my way through it before being at a, uh, a, a IEEE SA. But when I started to realize the most important things about it, for instance, on a conversation, one person speaks, you know, and then everybody else gets a chance to speak before speaking again. All of a sudden that became like the most important rule, <laughs> like things like that started to be the more important rules. Um, you know, the people valuing an agenda and, 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 you know, if you do it long enough, people come prepared to say, oh, you know, well, I tried to get something odd, but now I'm really going to take advantage of this approval of the agenda phase. Um, just all sorts of little things about how it changes the culture and how you can sort of ratchet up how strict you follow it versus how much you ease off and, you know, when it's effective. 
just so many things. And what's been nice is being able to tie it to, you know, learning these in a very similar culture, you know, similar kinds of personalities and things, even though it's not open source. Um, and, and then being able to apply it. And I'm hoping to be able to, you know, pass along as much as I can, but also just bring in and, and start growing community managers within our current program and helping and, and getting more people to experience that. And, and, you know, so it's not just my voice and my <laughs> disorganized way of explaining <laughs> things, but other <laughs> community managers uh, who could help share these stories and get involved in, um, you know, projects like Karsten is working on and whatnot to, to um, you know, transfer that learning. Um, uh, Josh, Joshua, very well said. And, and you, you brought up a couple of very interesting points that there's been a history of the cat herding and you know other techniques that were used in more formal organizations like standards bodies and program management for example inside companies and that we could learn a thing or two and you know maybe introduce some structure into community management which which can be adjusted based on which community you're working with can i jump in there uh, that that yes. actually really ties into uh what I wanted to touch on, um, I, I think it's wonderful that uh, you're literally digging up documents of some of this history of how communities were formed and, and managed to some extent. Uh, there's a, to some extent a, a, a terminology that I haven't heard uh, used as much and I don't know if that's, the industry doesn't go for it as often or if it is missing somewhere, but um, like a community engineer creating those structures, creating the documentation, that seems to be such a valuable part of this. Uh, having those well outlined things that have made the community successful. An example that uh, comes to mind is uh, with old forms, uh, moderators often, new moderators would be given like, here's a list of 20 or 30 things that create community engagement. Just put one of these out there every few days. That, that type of documentation is often built up over years, but having it allows the knowledge to be one kind of adapted to different communities, but two added upon as more and more community managers become involved. That is fabulous point, Salt. I was just thinking about uh, someone who I knew who called themselves a community architect because they said, you really need to understand uh, what the needs of the community are and then put the right structures and engagement in place to keep the you know, community engaged. And some of what you're describing is the science of engagement and uh, what do we need to do to make that happen, right? And, and in social media, we often do that. We say, oh, do, you know, your tweets on this day and you do the likes and retweets, but, but I haven't seen, um, maybe Jonah, you know, I haven't seen um, a set of documents on how do you engage the community and how do you, you know, continue to make it work. Yeah. Yeah, I think the tricky thing here in my mind is, and someone mentioned this earlier, I forget, sorry, forgive me, I forget who, who mentioned this, but you know, there are many different styles and methods, right, of building communities. And I think that's what's so exciting right now is, you know, we're kind of, um, we're all building our library of ideas and we're all coming at it from different perspectives, um, which can make it a little challenging, I think, for newcomers because they're trying to figure out, okay, well, which one of these multiple resources do I start with? Um, and I actually wanted, if you don't mind, Nithya, to ask a question of the group. Um, yes. Because We've talked about um, mentoring in these other areas. And one of the areas where I see, especially new community managers struggling the most is where, you know, getting everything set up and up and running with a new community um, is exciting and it's new and um, it's really motivating. And then when you launch it um, and then you get an initial influx of people and then it kind of starts to quieten down a little bit and then Sometimes then you don't see the growth that you're anticipating or you go into a company or a, a 
an existing community and you're there to kind of revitalize the community and what you're doing is not getting the results that you want to get. And I, I really, I've been there myself. I'm sure most of us have been there and it, it can feel pretty, um, it can feel pretty terrifying because you're thinking, okay, well, I can't tell people what to do because I'm facilitating a community. There are expectations of my performance and what I'm here to do. Um, and I'm not seeing the results that I'm getting. And I've known a lot of people, and again, I've experienced this personally, who have been very, very self-conscious and nervous, and it's generated a lot of anxiety. Um, and we often don't talk about that at CLS. We often talk about techniques and practices and approaches and metrics. But I think helping, like when people hit that difficult moment, um, I think some people are just wired up in a way where they they can just say, yeah, it sucks right now. It's difficult, but I'll battle. I'll battle on. I'll get through it. But other people, I think, I think find it uh, much more challenging to kind of get over that hump. And I'm just curious how we go about helping people with that, because I think often that can be when people quit and then they don't come back and they have a bit of almost like PTSD. Like they just it, it makes them very uncomfortable when they think about what they experienced and they don't necessarily want to come back again. So I just I'd love to get everyone's thoughts about. How have you managed that when you've experienced that and how you've gotten over the hump? Is it mentoring? Is it getting away from it for a while? I'd love to learn people's thoughts on that. Uh, this is uh, this is Ray. I've, um, I think I re we should um, practice what we preach, you know, kind of reach out to our own community. I've really found it helpful reaching out, you know, if I'm at a summit, kind of reaching out to people like you or Richard Millington or David or Bill Johnson, all the kind of luminaries and just talk and verbalize it. And often just verbalizing, verbalizing it helps uh, speaking with somebody else that's already be there, been there, or just a fresh set of eyes. It's amazing when you're in a, when you're, when you're in a hole, it's hard to see anything but the walls. You know, you need someone at the, at the top of the wall looking in and say, "Hey, what are you doing down there? There's a you know, there's blue sky and and fields and and beauty going on around here." And just getting another set of eyes. Uh, yeah. Uh, and when I when I'm thinking, Wenger has always helped me. Etienne Wenger, I love his book. So. He divides the community, communities of practice. You should look at three aspects. Uh, he calls them uh, domain, community, and practice. I call it purpose, people, and process. And very often we're stuck in a hole looking at one side saying, oh, my content's terrible. It's, yeah, I've got the wrong content where I need to get more content and doing, and it's not really the content, it's the people. You've got the wrong, you're addressing the wrong audience. The audience has moved on or it's the process and, and the process came really vividly this time with COVID because we had uh, for several communities, we were focused on face to face and like that went away. So we got to do something else. So I would, I would counsel that, you know, first ask somebody else and two, if, you, if you're still on your own, try isolating it into those three buckets, purpose, people and practice and seeing in fact, is it something else that you, is there something else that's a problem, not the one you're thinking of? Ray, could you kindly add the names of the authors that you mentioned and the books that you mentioned that you found? Oh, yes, sure. I, uh, add, I, uh, I have a whole shelf full, but uh, let's say this one is the one, uh, is it backwards? It's facility, I'll, I'll write it down anyway. It's Cultivating Community to Practice by Etienne Wenger. Uh, it's my Bible. It's like 30 years old, but it's still uh, the book to go to. Thank you so much. I'll write it, I'll write it in the chat and in the- um, Thank you, Ray. In the, in the document. Perfect. I think the point you also brought up is uh, how we can be a support community to each other and not just uh, for knowledge sharing, but for emotional support and to bounce back and to kind of build up our reserve again, right? Um, that, that was an excellent point. I know we have about two minutes left, folks. So any, any other best practice that we missed uh, capturing? And thank you, Brittany, for capturing all of the ideas that came out of this. Uh, if you could do a readout, please, at five o'clock, 
on some of the aha moments and some of the thank yous, or I can do the readout as well. <laughs> I'm still technically on my day off. This is my last day off of vacation. So I'm, I'm going to get up. <laughs> yes, yes. Um, I, I did have one, one more thing that I thought it's worth maybe bringing up. And that's that uh, there are techniques that be, can be gathered from different groups and uh, that are maybe not in our space at all. Uh, for instance, I, I saw a talk about some of the Occupy Wall Street organizers and the way they did deliberation and the hand signals they used. And I've since taken those, modified them to a kind of a ANSI or ASCII art online emoticon context and use them in the meetings for how to identify uh, who should be speaking, what you feel about topics. And the idea was how do you sit in a room with a hundred people and have them all have quick responses? That That's not like the tech community, but by using those techniques and looking for them elsewhere and seeing where they've been successful, including where they've been successful for self-care type things, um, we can then try to see if they work for us. Fabulous. Thank you, Salt. There's so many places that we can bring it to and also so many places we can apply uh, the power of community uh, engineering, community leadership, community management, right? To solve problems, not just in coding. So thank you all. Um, we are at 445. Thank you all for participating so actively and so vigorously. I think we learned it, community managers are not born, uh, sorry, not made, they're born. Uh, but then there are a number of resources that we can offer to help them you know, do their job better and to grow and to uh, become all they can be. Um, we'll do a wrap up at five o'clock and, and read out from this session as well as other sessions. Thank you so much for being here. And I hope to see you all at five o'clock um, for the readout.